today I will be talking through some of the reasons why conflict is so common among parents and teens, as well as strategies to help reduce this conflict. I'll start off by talking about three processes that are common experienced among all teens during this developmental period, uh, but that contribute to increased family conflict before talking about some of the difficulties that are more common among teens with ADHD that also lead to increased conflict. Although, and I'll then end by talking about some strategies that uh, parents can use to help reduce family conflict before we open it up for questions. So as I mentioned, there are several processes that occur during the teenage years that can explain some of the reasons why we see increased parent-teen conflict during this time. The first of these processes is referred to as separation. Separation is the process of teens pulling away from their parents and their family in order to create a more independent social group. Typically, that social group consists largely or solely of their friends and peers. During the teenage years, peers have a much larger influence on the interests, activities, as well as attire that teens uh, engage in. As a result of teens growing autonomy, adolescents oftenly, often try to gain more privacy from their parents, um, will often withdraw to their rooms, and communicate less with their parents about things that are going on in their daily lives, um, you know, negative experiences they might be having with peers. And this separation can really lead to conflict over the teens having a reduced involvement in the family, as well as um, an often increase of peer activities, which can sometimes include risky behaviors or behaviors that parents aren't comfortable with as well as conflict over how much personal information parents should have the right to know. For example, parents and teens often disagree with regard to the amount of access parents should have for things like social media accounts, text, emails, video game chats. And this is definitely um, something I anticipate people will have questions about. The second process um, is referred to as differentiation. This is the process of experimenting with one's own individuality and their identity development that often happens um, during the teenage years. Specifically, teens often experiment with different interests and images, um, including you know, the type of activities they wanna engage in, how they wanna dress, all the way to things like exploring sexual identity, gender identity, uh, to help them determine the type of person they wanna be and how their various identities play a role in their life. Differentiation can lead to conflicts, um, particularly when teens assume identities that parents might find unfamiliar or that don't align with their own values or what they want their teen to become or how they've envisioned uh, their teen to be growing up as they become a young adult. The third uh, normative process that occurs during the teenage years is referred to as opposition. And opposition is simply the process of teens challenging parental authority. And this is done in an effort to become more self-determined. It's one of these things that is kind of a double-edged sword. We know that teens need to go out on their own, often um, starting jobs for the first time or living on their own if they go to college. Um, and so in order to be able to become more autonomous, there's some kind of normative process where teens are going to be pushing the boundaries, challenging the limits of um, their parents' authority. But this can clearly lead to conflicts over um, parent demands, specifically when teens don't follow or in um, more common cases take too long to follow parental requests or rules. Uh, for example, a common one that I often hear is, you know, parents saying how teens take way too long to get off their phone or to stop playing video games um, in order to do something that was asked of them, like get ready for bed, start their homework or clean up. 
So if all of those processes were not enough for explaining uh, conflict in the teenage years, teens with ADHD have a range of additional associated or core difficulties that make conflict especially common among families of teens with ADHD. The first of these is the fact that teens with ADHD often experience difficulties with executive functions. Executive functions are responsible for many of the skills we need to be able to function successfully in day-to-day -day life. This includes things like paying attention, organizing, planning, and prioritizing what you need to do, being able to start tasks and stay focused on them long enough to complete them, being able to manage your time, as well as to engage in self-monitoring or the ability to keep track of what you're doing. These difficulties are often what makes completing and turning in homework so challenging because they either forgot to write down the assignment, forgot to bring the materials that they need, or they start doing it and they get distracted. This is also, which is a common enough source of conflict, but this is also what leads to conflict often over teens not doing what parents have asked of them, either because they had difficulty initially paying attention or because of this poor self-monitoring and poor working memory that if you've asked them to do a couple things, they might have forgotten what they were supposed to do. And so these things often lead to a lot of frustration and feelings um, like their kids aren't trying or that they're being disrespectful, when in reality, these underlying difficulties um, of executive functions are an area that typically is about two to three years behind typically developing peers without ADHD. A second reason why teens with ADHD experience higher levels of conflict, both with peers and with parents, is the fact that they have difficulty managing their emotions. Russell Barkley has described teens with ADHD as having a low frustration tolerance, impatience, and quickness to anger. Specifically, teens with ADHD are less able to moderate or suppress and kind of manage their emotional reactions they experience. This is especially true in frustrating or upsetting situations. And so teens with ADHD are more likely to show an impulsive or extreme reaction relative to other teens their age in these types of situations. These extreme reactions can often be very upsetting or embarrassing for parents and can cause additional conflict. A third reason why there's high levels of conflict among teens with ADHD is due to the significant motivational deficits teens ex with ADHD experience. Specifically, teens with ADHD have often had years of negative feedback from peers, from teachers, from siblings, from parents, and all of this negative feedback has often um, led to them feeling like no matter what they do, it's not good enough, so why even bother, or why even try? And that coupled with what we know to be the, um, an aversion to either boring or difficult tasks or tasks that require sustained attention among teens with ADHD can really collectively contribute to why it seems like these teens are really just struggling to be motivated, struggling to get their work done. And Understandably so, these motivational deficits often leave parents feeling really frustrated because they feel like their teen just doesn't care or that they're not reaching their potential. And so finding that balance of how to set realistic and achievable, but still motivating goals for your teens is something that's really important. And we'll talk about some strategies for how to help encourage that and address motivational deficits in a couple minutes. The final area I want to touch on before moving to those strategies that is often a source of conflict and hard for parents of teens with ADHD to address is the fact that teens with ADHD are at risk for engaging in various risk-taking and risky behaviors such as alcohol and other substance use, 
Additionally, because of difficulties, both with impulse control and emotion regulation, ha they have higher rates of risky behaviors, um, as well as poor decision-making. One of the reasons why this can be challenging is that we know teens with ADHD often have difficulty making as well as keeping friends. And so it's challenging for parents often to find this balance between encouraging peer interactions among their teens with ADHD while still appropriately setting limits as well as trying to prevent engagement in these various risky behaviors. So now that you hopefully have a little bit more of a sense of why teens with ADHD experience so much conflict, particularly with parents, but also with peers and others, I wanna talk through some strategies to help reduce this conflict. So as I mentioned a moment ago, we know teens with ADHD get a lot of negative feedback and have often had many experiences with failures. So one of the strategies that we encourage parents to do to help with motivation, as well as to reduce conflict, is to acknowledge and appreciate steps that are in the right direction of the outcome you want, not just a successful final outcome. So an example of this would be, you know, your child has 20 missed assignments, 10 missed assignments, rather than only reinforcing when they have completed all of those late assignments for partial credit or maybe because of a 504 plan they're able to turn them in late still for full credit you want to be providing reinforcement of i know this was a lot i'm so proud of you for getting those first couple done let's keep talking through ways to help you get these done because i know it can feel overwhelming when you have gotten behind so you really want to focus on and complement your teen's efforts rather than the outcome. Because one of the things we know is that because of often uh, comorbid difficulties with learning, that sometimes teens with ADHD can try really, really hard and the outcome still might not be what you hope for, what you want, but if you know that they've tried their best, they've put their effort, you really wanna focus on and complement that. The other helpful hint to kind of remember this focusing on approximations or steps in the right direction is to go by the simple rule of trying to provide three positive points of feedback or comments for every one negative point of feedback you get. The reason why this is so important is that we as human beings are evolutionarily attuned to attend to negative things. So when something has gone wrong, we want to put out that fire and we often provide a lot of attention to that. So if you ask your teen to do something and they go and do it, you often aren't going to attend to that of thank you for listening the first time or thank you for helping me bring in the groceries. That's a big help. You often comment on the time when they're not doing what you want or when there's that negative behavior. And so especially among teens with ADHD, they're getting berated with all these negative comments. And so we want to be focusing on when they are doing the things we want, especially, or approximating. So maybe they remembered to bring in the groceries, but they put them down as soon as they entered in the door rather than bringing them into the kitchen. So you can still say, you know, thank you so much for bringing the groceries into the house. It was a really big help. Would you mind helping me now bring these in to the house or into the kitchen? Um, and so you still want to acknowledge their efforts rather than just saying, why did you leave the groceries in the front of the house um, and getting upset that they didn't do what you wanted. Related to this point, one of the kind of phrases that I kind of live by and encourage parents to live by is pick your battles. This couldn't be more true than right now during COVID when families are spending so much time together. If you are attending to all of the small little annoyances, those eye rolls, those sighs, you are going to be setting yourself up for constantly being annoyed, constantly being frustrated, and likewise your team being really frustrated that you're always nitpicking on them. And so really trying to comment on those negative behaviors when they are bigger things. That could be, and that could be different for each family. For some it's swearing, for some it's yelling, for some it's only when they get physical. Um, for others, it might be smaller things like if they're 
stomping up and down the stairs. I've heard some parents who that doesn't bother them, others who that's totally not acceptable. A second general strategy that will really help reduce conflict is trying to provide opportunities for your team to feel like they have a sense of autonomy and that they're becoming more self-determined by providing them with opportunities to have choices and control. This can be small things like letting your team decide what will be for dinner or the order that they have to complete their chores on a weekend. Using forced choices like would you rather help me bring the groceries in or help your dad mow the lawn. And giving this control and choices to your teens will make the commands that you do give or the things that you're telling them they have to do and there isn't an option a lot easier to take in rather than the teen feeling like I'm always being told what to do all the time. Related to giving these commands, so when there are things that have to happen and are not optional or you can't really give control, it's really important that when you're giving these commands that you're doing so in a firm and calm manner. Sometimes our natural instinct is to just increase the volume because we think that that'll make them listen or that'll make them comply. And in reality, increasing the volume doesn't work and, and oftentimes can just escalate the situation and make your teen upset. And it's also modeling anger as well as dysregulation which is negative, which is not going to be helpful for your team being able to learn their own emotion regulation strategies. One of the things that often leads to conflict among teens and their parents is teens feeling like their parents are being unfair. I'm sure you've all heard the word unfair way more times than you can count. And when teens say this, parents often feel like the teen's being disrespectful and it kind of becomes this back and forth, really frustration, uh, mutual frustration. And so there's a couple general strategies that can help parents and teens feel like the situations are more fair and that it's clear what's being expected. So the first of these is making sure that you're providing consistent expectations so that the teen knows what to expect of them. One of the big things related to this is you want to make sure that your reinforcement, either positive or negative, for behaviors or misbehaviors are consistent with what is being expected. So just as you wouldn't give, you know, a trip to Disney World because your teen got A's on a report card, a teen shouldn't be grounded because they missed curfew or lied one time. You want to focus on smaller, more immediate responses, both positive and negative. What oftentimes happens, though, particularly in response to negative behaviors, is that parents can act out of anger. And this can lead to giving bigger punishments, such as no electronics for a month or being grounded for three months. And these type of large punishments, while they might feel like this was a really big misbehavior, what it can actually cause is what we refer to as a downward spiral where you've already taken away this really big privilege and so you have to keep taking away other smaller things or other privileges until there's truly nothing left for the team to lose and then they feel like they're and then uh, they feel like no matter what they do there's no point of trying they can't get what they want um, and it really leads to no motivation as well as more misbehavior and so that's why having smaller, more immediate punishments can be just as, if not more effective. Specifically, it can lead to improving behavior because the teens feel like, you know, tomorrow is a new day and that they can be set up for success or, you know, next week is a new week if it's a little bit longer. But this also reduces conflict because I'm sure you've all had experiences with your teens kind of negotiating to earn privileges back or be able to get things back that they've lost. One of the final things related to this, and this is a really important one that's easier said than done, is that once a privilege has been earned, 
it can't be taken away, no matter how bad a misbehavior is that occurs. So I'm gonna give an example. So if your teen has earned the opportunity to go somewhere special with a friend over the weekend, maybe because they got good grades or they did, they helped out around the house, whatever you, um, you had set up, even if your teen engages in a serious behavior on Thursday or Friday, kind of right before when that special event was gonna happen, that special trip cannot be taken away as a punishment. Instead, another privilege such as electronics should be taken away instead. Because otherwise, teens start to learn that they can't trust you at your word, that you know when they do something good and have earned something, that it can still be taken away. And that really leads to this feelings of things being unfair as well as increases in conflict. The last point I wanna to touch on before we open it up for questions is to talk about how to avoid power struggles. So first and foremost, if your goal during a conflict with your team is to win control of the situation, then I would say you've already lost. When we shift the focus during a conflict from the disagreement itself and what led to that to proving who is in charge of the outcome, this is a power struggle. And this shift results in a missed opportunity for emotional development, conflict management skills, as well as parent-teen relationship development. So three strategies to help avoid these power struggles are to really remember that conflict between any two people arises because those two people have different sets of thoughts and emotions about that same issue. And so as a parent, it's really important that you try to understand your teen's emotions and thoughts that might be underlying the behavior. You might not agree with the behavior, you might not think that it was an appropriate behavior, but showing empathy and understanding for why they did what they did or acted the way they did can really help reduce this butting of heads or this power struggle. Related to this, by being able to focus on the reason for the conflict or the reason for the issue, why the teen did what they did, it can allow you and your teen to help your teen build problem solving skills and be able to learn how to come up with solutions and compromises to address a situation. And this is a really critical skill that they're going to need in their own lives with their peers when they go off to college, if they have a future partner or when they're in a job being able to critically manage and in a calm way, conflicts. Additionally, while we know disagreements and conflicts are a natural part of life, it's important that we can help our teens be able to respectfully assert themselves and to successfully resolve conflicts peacefully. So one of the things that can be helpful with this is that when possible, we wanna to try to recognize when a problem might arise and figure out what to say or do to avoid that problem from continuing to reoccur in the future. The reason why this can be helpful is it's easier to address conflicts, not in the heat of a moment. So if you just had this argument, we often wanna to try to resolve it as quickly as possible, but we also wanna to try to resolve it as helpfully and peacefully as possible so this doesn't occur again. And so trying to address a conflict at the peak of the disagreement often only results in escalation and more hurt feelings. Instead, giving both parties time to calm down and address the issue when you both have had some time to think about it, reflect on your behaviors, and are more calmly able to engage in a discussion can really help your team be able to develop these important emotion regulation and conflict management skills. One of the simple strategies that I'll throw out now related to this is encouraging your teens as well as yourself to engage in what we call coping skills. Coping skills are any behavior that can help you feel better, that are not harmful to yourself or to someone else. Some common coping skills are things like talking to someone like a friend, exercising such as going for a walk or run, listening to music, drawing or writing in a journal, taking a nice hot shower or bath, 
taking some time and space, such as going to your room to calm down. This could involve taking some deep breaths or practicing mindfulness. By giving yourself that space and time to have a, um, an opportunity to calm down and collect your thoughts can make your discussion a lot more effective and help prevent future conflict. At this time, um, I am going to turn it back over to Joyous. I just want to make you aware um, on this slide are many resources related to some of the topics that I was touching on. These are available in the handouts, um, so you don't have to worry about writing them down right now. <laughs>